How's it going everybody? My name's Dave Whipple and you're watching Bush Radical. Today I'm here with my lovely wife Brooke and we're going to tell you guys everything that we know anyway about how to find remote property. Not only that, but we're going to talk about the things you're going to want to consider if living on a remote piece of property and homesteading a remote piece of wilderness is in your future plans. Stay tuned. <music> Recently, Brooke and I went to look at a piece of property. We found it on the internet on a realtor's website, and it looked like it was in a wonderful part of the state. We're up in the far north of northern Michigan. Now, this piece is very remote. But judging by Google Earth, the timber on the property, not to mention about 2,000 feet of river frontage, really spoke to us. It, it told us that this property is probably exactly what we're looking for. So we're going to make sure that we get there first and take a look at this before the snow melts and everybody can get back into this area. So what we're doing, we're out here in the middle of nowhere and we're looking at a, at a piece of property here that's uh, it's got a whole bunch of river frontage. It's four foot of snow and snow machine in for miles and miles and miles. Now when buying a remote piece of property or going to look at one, we had to do a lot of homework so that we could actually locate where we were when we're out there in the middle of nowhere. We had to know where the landmarks are, how the trail goes, so that when we found the property, we'd know that we're in the right spot. The first day we were out on the property, we were very impressed, but it didn't really jibe with what we saw from Google Earth. So we went back the following day to take another look. We'll talk about that in a bit. One of the first things you have to understand is remote property and off-grid property are not the same thing. You can be off-grid in the suburbs, you can be off-grid in the city, but remote property is what a lot of people think about when they hear off-grid. They think Grizzly Adams, they think Dick Prennicke, they think way out in the weeds. And the question is always, how do you make that happen? How do you find a piece of property that's really remote, that's beautiful, that's got everything you want, and then how do you make a living once you find it? How do you make this happen? It's a very confusing topic because a lot of people here off-grid, they think remote. Today we're talking about remote property. So a lot of questions we get are, where do you go to look for this kind of property? Where do you find remote property? You find remote property where there are no people. That is the criteria. If you live in a metropolitan area and you think you're gonna go 10 miles out of town and find remote property, it's a pipe dream. It's not gonna happen. If you really want to be remote, you've got to be a long ways away from civilization. If you want to walk out your door any time of the day and hear nothing but peace and quiet, that's a rare thing in this world today. You have to be away from people, so don't bother looking in the skirts of the suburbs or just outside of the, the country town that you live in. Remote property is going to need a remote setting. How do you find it? you got to do a lot of homework. First of all, we like to just drive around. I mean, we have found a lot of properties just driving around because we like the feel of the area. It's got to have a great feel. And you're not going to know that until you've got boots on the ground and you're in the area and you can feel it. One thing that we can both vouch for that is a solid piece of information, go find an area that you love and then start looking for property, right? Absolutely. If you're in a part of the country where uh, maybe you can't find this type of property and you are looking out of state, you need to actually go to that state, Absolutely. go to that area that you want to look at and actually look at stuff. Do not ever trust something from the internet or a realtor. We call it realtor voodoo. For instance, this piece of property, we have yet to find any picture that represents this property at all. This piece of property we found on, on a realtor site. We're not going to tell you which one. It's got river frontage and we asked the, the representative, were these pictures of the river taken on the property? And she said, no, they weren't which, you know, is ridiculous. You don't know what river you're even getting then, right? You cannot trust a realtor. Sometimes no. you can't even trust the, the seller to relay correct information. You actually need permission to go walk the land yourself, try to find the corners, and a lot of times there's not gonna be any corners. And there's some tricks and tactics for finding out, accurately find out where the lot lines are. One of the things we use all the time, whether we're buying a property or just looking at stuff, acre value and Google Earth. Now, I know that's a pretty, pretty modern way to look at things, but with Google Earth, you can take a look at a piece of property and zoom in to where you can actually see what the trees are like, what the, what the layout is like, how it orients north, south, east, and west, and you can get a real, real good idea of what the property is going to be like with this satellite overview. 
On day two of walking the property, we'd had another chance to take a look at Google Earth and kind of reorient ourselves as to where we were and where we needed to be. Two major features of this property were a large clearing in the river. The first day we were out there, we found a clearing, but it did not run north and south like it was supposed to. It ran east and west, so we knew we were in the wrong spot. We went back to the hotel room later on that evening and figured out where we actually were. The following day we went back, we found the correct clearing, and from there we knew it was only about a quarter mile out to the river, which we found very easy. Then we knew exactly where we were at, and we could cross-reference where we were and what we saw with Google Earth later on that evening. The other really important thing with Google Earth is you can back that thing out and you can see where other people in the area have homesteads or cabins too. And that's really important to us, and it's probably important to you too, to know, is there a cabin right up next to the, the lot line? Are there cabins all around? Is there a junkyard or has <laughs> it been logged? I mean, the realtor is not gonna tell you that. No. We recently looked at a piece of property that had a beautiful little crick on it. The realtor photos were beautiful. We get to the property, 40 acre piece had been completely logged. They never even mentioned it. That's not a joke. That is not a joke. It was infuriating. Yeah, they're talking about this beautiful property and this beautiful creek and stuff, and we get there, and we're looking for this swath of pine trees that was on, that we saw on the internet. And it's gone, because it's been logged off. And they never mentioned that. It was logged recently, too. It had like chest high briars everywhere. It was not cool. There was nothing cool about that. So, now what acre value does is show you the actual layout of the lots and the acreage. And so you can have an overlay of like a satellite image and see where the actual acreage lies on the land. It's a fantastic tool. It's basically a, a cheap version of Google Earth because it doesn't get super detailed, but it's got the plats superimposed over top of the Google Earth image. So you can really see like, here's your line, here's the neighbor and how close are they to you. You can also see, and this is a really important thing, you can see where all the state land is, you can see where all the federal land is, the, the Department of Natural Resources land. If you find a spot, you're like, wow, this is beautiful land. You can actually find it on acre value, find out who the owner is, and you could contact the owner with an offer. Yeah, we have absolutely found pieces of land that we were interested in that were never for sale. We've contacted owners of properties and say, hey, you know, this has been sitting here forever. Are you interested in selling? Or if you're not right now, take our number, call us, you never know. A lot of times you'll see like an abandoned camp or like an old building that's fallen in. And I mean, you know nobody lives there. That building and maybe the vehicles that are in the area and of course the road, you can find that on acre value, find where that property is, see who owns it. Maybe somebody in the family passed away and it went to kids and they don't even care about it. And you could maybe get a really good deal. Well, I think we found the river. I'm gonna name this Dave's River, not Brooks River, because I have discovered it. Well, anyway, it's right in that hole. Let's go look. We spent a lot of the second day walking that property on snowshoes in beautiful weather at the very end of winter. And what we found out was Acre Value and Google Earth were the two most important tools that we used to figure out where we were on the land, where the borders of the property were, to make sure that we're on the right piece of property. Without the owner there with us or a surveyor, out in the middle of the wilderness, you could be anywhere. With Google Earth and Acre Value, we could match the owner up with the property that they own that is actually for sale, see where all the landmarks are, how they run, east and west, north and south, match it all up in person, on foot, and know with 100% certainty that we're in the right spot looking at the right land. There's an absolutely monstrous white pine across this river. Watching a woman get undressed in the woods. Sure seemed like it would have been better than this. I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Look what happened to Bushy. Just like that, I stepped on my snowshoes and went headlong in the snow. Didn't take long for that comment to bite me. One thing that's really important, especially with this property we're talking about here, is it's the middle of winter. We're coming out of winter, but there's two feet of snow on the ground. Right now, in 2021, the real estate market is hot for oh, off-grid properties. The, the realtor actually did us a favor by misrepresenting this property. You really did need to get here and look at it. And we had to put in a pretty fair amount of effort to come see it, which includes uh, snow machines, snowshoes. We really wanted a shot at getting this piece of property before spring rolled around and everything melted out and you could actually drive to this property, which you can't do right now. In a month and a half, 
there'll be people with side-by-sides up and down this road. We're in the, the northern part of the Upper Peninsula. It's huge recreation property. Not a lot of people live here year-round, but in the summer you'll find dirt bikes and quads and side-by-sides because there's logging roads forever. There's thousands and thousands of miles of logging roads and people would find this property and it's super easy to just drive right on here, walk around and be like, this is amazing and then buy it. And we, we weren't going to let that happen. Here we are. So here's the deal. We came out here last uh, two weeks ago. We, we walked this property right before dark. We're like, well, it doesn't quite look exactly like what we saw on the map. So we came back the following day with a little bit more time. We found the other entrance into the property and it, it was lined up exactly with what we saw on Google Earth. And we left right from there. We went right to the realtor's office, put in an offer on it, and then we hit the road. About 45 minutes later, we got a phone call. So we just came out of the middle of nowhere back into cell service land. We put in an offer on that property and they took it. It's ours. So that's going to be oh. the future home of the Whipples at some point. We've been super, super stoked about this property ever since we saw it. We knew roughly where it was at. We, we got the old junk snow machines running and got the trailer registered and weighed. We had to drag it out of the snow, take it to the dump to have it weighed at the weigh station. <laughs> For everybody else out there that's looking through the, the real estate listings, they see it, they see it's remote, they think, well, especially where we're at here in the far northern Midwest up by Lake Superior, they think, well, you can't get in to see that. Well, we made a Herculean effort last minute to, to get in here to take a look at this property and it's so paid off. So if you really want a piece of property, put in the effort. You actually need to get the plane ticket if it's in a different state, go look at the property, get a feel for it. We wanted to beat this market and, and that's what we did. If you're serious about off-grid land, you've got to be serious about putting in the effort to check it out and vet it. You need to vet it because the realtor doesn't vet it for you. No. You can see a property that's absolutely exactly what you want. And if you buy it through the internet, you can pretty much be assured when you get there, there's going to be a crack house and pit bulls right up against the property <laughs> line and junk cars on the other side. Next to an airport. Yeah, there's going to be an airstrip, <laughs> right? So there's going to be planes coming over it. That's just the way it is. I don't know how many times we've looked at property that looked amazing on the real estate site and then you get there and they've totally neglected that it's a, like a barren parking lot around it full of like drug houses and, and dogs. You have to do your homework yourself. Uh, a GPS. I'm not super great on using this yet, but as we're walking around, I'm marking some waypoints and I'm learning. You can use new technology. He's been walking around with a compass. Use your tools and do not count on information from a realtor or a seller. No. Which brings us to another point. The three things you really have to look at. You have to look at access and you have to look at water and you have to look at how are you going to make a living because that's just the reality of it. I think this is a great time to bring up the point that if you're just looking for recreation property, the sky's the limit. You can go anywhere and Beautiful. buy any piece of property that you can afford if you just want to go there on weekends and holidays and just enjoy the place for what it is. With this video, what we're really doing is we're talking about buying a piece of beautiful, remote, quiet land somewhere and making it your home, actually homesteading on it and setting that up as your primary residence. And ultimately, how do you actually live on a piece of property that is that remote? How do you get in and out in terrible weather? How do you make sure your access is going to be okay? Does the property have good groundwater? Does the property have a spring or a creek or a river? Does the property have enough cleared area that you can use solar power for your power needs? Access is huge, resources are huge. We've lived on some pretty nightmare roads and we currently still do in Alaska. It was to the point at one point we were thinking about selling our land because the access was getting unbearable. And it just wears on you. You think, oh, I can deal with it, but it just absolutely wears you down. There's been a lot of time on our piece in Alaska that we have right now where you'd drive to town and you'd see like rain clouds 
on the horizon up north where, where the house was. And you're like, I'm not making it home And you're today. like, yeah, it's going to rain and the road is going to be impassable and I'm, I'm going to have to walk the last two miles home. That'll just burn you out. On this piece, this is snow machine access for three, four months out of the year. So, I mean, that's something that's going to deter a lot of people. But it's okay for us. We don't mind that. But if you think you're going to buy a piece of property in September and there's a beautiful road to it, well, if it's an unmaintained road, it could be three feet of snow in the wintertime. You just have to know that sort of thing. Here we are in the winter. Now we completely know what it's like to get in here on the winter. We don't know what the road is going to be like in the summer yet. We're going to have to figure that out. So there, there are different seasons. You're not going to probably be able to see all the seasons right away unless you know someone in the area of what the access is going to be like. So it could be a surprise. <laughs> Uh, and it might be, I know there's probably at least one or two holes here that are going to be filled with water and may be difficult at some point, but we're going to figure that out. And, and the opposite side of that is, what would winter look like if you're buying something in the summer? Be realistic about the access. Don't romanticize it away, because it is an actual big deal. Another good piece of advice is if you find a piece of property you absolutely love, don't wait. Make that offer. We were looking at a piece in Delta Junction, Alaska. And all through the winter, we had it in our minds, it's 30 below, 40 below there right now. Nobody's buying real estate. So we took our time. When we finally made an offer, we found someone had beat us to it by a couple days. And it was already under contract. The other option would have been we wait until springtime when we can drive in here. But at that point, anybody that's interested in a remote property, whether it's to live on or whether it's recreational, we'd be competing with every single person in the market who's looking for a piece like this. And even though the realtor pictures were garbage, this property, if you were on it, you would be impressed by it much more than you would have from the photographs. So as soon as the road opens, it would have got sold just like that. And she had said the owner and her were gonna come out and walk the property in the spring and take better pictures. <laughs> well, that would have definitely sold the property. Another issue is power. You might as well just accept the fact that you're gonna be running a generator, you're gonna maybe have a simple solar panel set up and minimize the amount of electricity that you're gonna use. And then it opens the world up to you. You don't have to have a piece of property that's remote but has power. That's a very hard combination to find. It's very easy to find remote property. It's very easy to find property that's not remote that's got power, but to find the two together and for an affordable price. If you're looking for a unicorn, figure on minimizing the way you operate you don't have to have a 4,000 watt solar system where you can run an arc welder off it. Just a couple panels to charge your phones, to run some LED lights at nighttime. The solar, the remote power generators that operate off solar, and just all the technology has really caught up and made it much easier to be off-grid and still have all the things you love. Off-grid, the biggest question is how do you make a living? Can you actually move out into a, a remote area and still have enough income to buy groceries when you run into town or to buy clothes or whatever. That's a big, big conundrum. It's a hard nut to crack. I mean, you're still going to have bills. The homestead is going to require money still after you buy and build. You still need money. But our advice is to take your job with you. Whatever you're doing, find a way to do it remote, find a way to do it off grid, become a specialist in something, and make that your job. Make it your goal to take your job with you. Now you can commute to work if you have work that's close enough. Two people around here that we know, uh, one guy, he has a four mile drive out to a main road, which is probably a snowmobile ride right now, and then he drives to town. I have a cousin who has a gas station, and he drives to a parking spot, gets on a snowmobile, and then drives back into his property on a snowmobile about seven miles and he does that. If you're willing to go to those extremes of commuting, you don't have to worry about making a living on your property. But if you if you really want to just make a living on your own land, it's going to take a lot of ingenuity. For us, we get revenue from YouTube, so we're always shooting films for you guys and that really helps to do something like this. But 
we would still have to drive into a library to upload a video to answer comments because there's definitely no internet out here. There's no cell service out here. Yeah, those are things you have to think about too and we're gonna have to think about it here is how to boost cell signals, how to, uh, you know, to maybe just do basic just answering emails and stuff and having a phone. You know, because right now this is my only means of communication. It's kind of just an emergency device. This is a Garmin inReach and it's connected to the satellite I pay for with the subscription. So I can send a message to somebody you could also get a sat phone but take your job with you specialize in something get it established and take it with you the internet is just full of opportunities for remote work yeah you got to figure out the cell signal or you've got to be able to get out you know once or twice a week to, to access the internet now there is a new product I think it's called Starlink it's by Elon Musk and that is uh, it's a satellite internet that's portable. You just set it up and it picks up the satellites and you can get internet. We don't have that, but that's something we're definitely going to look into on this property. Because if you do have the internet, you can make a living off the internet, whether it's selling stuff on eBay. I have an Etsy store. Brooke has I make, an Etsy store. You know, and that's, that's the beautiful thing. Like I do all this art and jewelry and stuff. And a lot of people have talents like that. You know, if you just say on your shop, hey, I ship one day a week, right? So the orders come in, all you're doing is shipping them once a week. You're getting off your property once a week. You know, you can be creative with things. You can figure out how to make it work. And if you actually want that kind of a lifestyle, living on a remote property, that's kind of what you're stuck with. You have to be committed to commute or you have to figure out how to operate from your property and still be able to have an income and that goes along with the solar and you know that goes back to access and what does the property provide for you i mean we have a lot of great open space in this piece of property along with just really deep woods it's perfect for solar so if you're buying a piece of property that's just completely wooded you're going to have to think about the solar options everything plays into your long-term game solar access water resources your job the dream of living off grid anybody can do that Anybody can do that. You just have to change the way you operate a bit. The dream of living remote, it's a cookie. It's a real cookie. You really have to figure that one out or it's just going to be a dream. It's not going to be easy. And it won't be fun either. <laughs> <laughs> but it's worth it, I think. You know, if we, if we get this property figured out, we should be able to operate from this property totally remote. But we're going to bring you guys along for that journey. So you're going to see exactly what that looks like, at least the way we're doing it. And uh, you, you'll see what works for us and you'll see where we maybe have an idea that's a, that's a turd and doesn't go anywhere. There's a lot of different ways to live and work remotely off-grid. These are just some ideas. We just want to help you guys because we get this question so much. Make sure you got some kind of an idea of what your options are for water. If it's 400 feet to water, you can't do a hand well. If it's all rock, you can't do a hand well. If you don't have a crick or something else, you have to have a well or you have to be committed to use rainwater. So, I mean, your options are right out there on the table. When you find a piece of property that you're considering, you just have to run through that checklist. Like on this property, I think we can drive a hand well and get decent water, but if we can't, we do have a river to pull water out of and then we're in a situation where we have to purify. If we had to have a well put in, we can't get a well truck in here because it's just a trail for three or four miles getting out of here to another trail that a well truck could drive down. So it's melting snow in the winter or just strictly rainwater in the summer, pulling from a creek. You know. If you've watched One Man's Wilderness and you think living remote is the answer to everything that you want in life, we're sorry that we burst your bubble. <laughs> <laughs> We've lived in remote settings in the Aleutian Islands. We owned remote property in Minto Flats in interior Alaska. Uh, I'm going to tell you right up front, we don't have all the answers, but if you're in the market to make a major life change and live in a remote setting and try to make that work, hope this video helped out. My name's Dave Whipple and this is my wife, Brooke Whipple. You've been watching Bush Radical. Be radical, eh? See you soon. <laughs>